How many's got your Bibles? Let me see those. Physical Bibles, hold them up high. Well done. Electronic Bibles, let me see those. Somebody literally just waved Facebook at me. Man, don't, don't, don't be, don't be telling me you got your Bible app up when you still, you got social media hanging on your screen. At least turn your phone around. See, some of you used to say, well, listen, I, I got my Facebook out because I'm just trying to make sure that our Facebook Live is, is you know, functioning properly and da-da-da-da. Today's message will post Thursday, Thursday's post Sunday, so that don't fly no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I could be like the government and just say, if you see your friends on social media, take a picture of them and send it to me and write your friends out. But I'm not doing that. Not doing that. All right, turn with me, please, to the book of Joshua, chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. I'm not going to take a lot of time today to read the story in its entirety. I'll just encourage you to do so at a later date or time as it relates to the story of the children of Israel and the city of Jericho. I want, you to, I want you to hear this. I wait on ideas and subjects and themes that, that I believe are inspired of the Lord to acquire the right message in season for you. But at the same time, I've noticed, especially more so in recent weeks, that as I am committed to doing that in the midst of the message, the Lord will inspire me in an in a area and in a vein that's not in my notes at all. And it's like in the midst of me releasing that, I know that it's not only for you, but the Lord is speaking to me. This one got me before I preached it. Even in the study for it, the Lord began to speak to me about me and where we're at as a body. And so how many of you are note takers? Hold it high. You're taking notes. Good job. How many of you just have a kind of memory that you remember everything? Can't remember when men's meeting is, but you can remember the scriptures. <laughs> Jericho. How many knows the story of Jericho? How many has never heard of the story of Jericho? How many didn't vote? Jericho was an impediment. 50 cent word meaning obstruction or hurdle to Israel receiving their inheritance. <laughs> you guys do understand that God has a spiritual inheritance <laughs> waiting on you. Are you aware of that? He has a spiritual inheritance that is waiting on you, and it's not waiting on you to turn 18 or 21, or 25, he's just waiting on you to turn obedient. Oh, God, help me right now. It's, it's not an age. It's not a number. It's not a date. It's a heart condition. God's just looking for people to whom he can trust to do what he says do in the way he says do it. I 
just had this conversation with one of my kids. I forget which. And that wasn't a funny. It's the truth. I don't remember which one it was. Um, Abraham and Sarah. Prophetic voice comes. A year's time, you're going to have a son. Sarah laughs vehemently. I don't believe that was a little, <laughs> I think that was a, <laughs> okay. So then, as a part of this whole story, go back and read it, they decided that God needed their help and not their obedience. So in their effort to help God, they help the enemy to produce a race that would always fight against what God intended. So God don't need your help. He needs your obedience. Some of you are advanced in years and wondering why the prophetic words over your life have not yet come to pass. And you blame God or you blame the, the prophetic voice that released the word when neither one of them are to blame. It was you. God set the vision and you set the expectation. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Drawn sword does not mean approach me. <laughs> and yet Joshua went up to him and asked, are you here for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Skip down now to chapter 6, first verse. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. Jericho was shut up. Why? Because of the children of Israel. Picture Jericho like a turtle. And when the turtle senses danger, what does he do? Goes into the shell. What did Jericho do? They went into their shell. Not sticking his head out, not sticking his tail out, went into the shell. God has been speaking to some of you consistently for a very long time. In fact, it's been so consistent that you have now doubted that it's God. It's been so consistent, it's like a squeaky fan. And you just, it blends into the background. But at the end of our days, when we take our last breath here and our first breath there, and the Lord says, why didn't you do what I spoke to you to do? And our response is along the lines of, Lord, I didn't know you said anything. And he plays the tape. Just because the word is consistent and goes on for long periods of time 
doesn't make it not God. Man, I've just switched gears. Some of you, when you lay down at night, the last thing on your mind is what God has told you to do and all the excuses, yes, I said it, all the excuses begin to flood in as to why it's okay that you haven't, that you haven't started, that you haven't applied for it, that you haven't pursued it, that you haven't attained it, all of these things, and, and you justify it until it anesthetizes that, that word of what you're supposed to do. So you go to sleep, and you may or may not have a dream about it, and when you wake up in the morning, the first thought in your mind is, I need to get started doing those things that I just excuse myself last night from doing this to go to sleep. And this has become your, your way of life. You go to bed thinking about it. You wake up thinking about it. And all your waking hours is giving yourself reasons, just like we talked about Thursday. It's, it's giving the excuses as to why I shouldn't attend, shouldn't go, shouldn't do, shouldn't say, shouldn't be. All those things are, are arising. And, and I'm telling you, this, this is something I've, I'm having to learn about God. Yes, he's gracious. Yes, he's kind. Yes, it's the goodness and kindness of God that brings people to repentance. But I believe that God did not crucify all anger. I believe there's still a righteous anger that comes up on the inside of him when his own children refuse to listen, refuse to obey, and refuse to pay attention to what it is that he's saying. He grows tired of that type of response when he has offered so much to provide everything to us, and then we ignore it. There is a thing called righteous anger. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, four of us got it. Basically, it means garbage in. Have you noticed that you can tell who people have been talking to when you ask them a question and they give you this prefab response and you go, I've heard that before. Where'd I hear that? Oh, yeah. So-and-so's been saying that consistently now for the longest time. They've been hanging out with so-and-so. How do you know that? Because so-and-so invested in them so that they're saying not just the same thing, but exactly the same thing. How do you suppose that people know you've been hanging out with Jesus? Huh? Because you're saying the same stuff he's been saying. And you're acting the same way that Jesus acts. And you're doing the same stuff that Jesus does. or not so let me tell you about three different types of churches and people the first one is the undertaking church now I don't mean undertaking as in undertaker but undertaking is a church that's always looking backwards they settle for far less, far beneath, far under what God has called them to. You start talking about today or tomorrow, and their response is only what they feel. Oh, God, help me right now. How many has ever dealt with somebody who's got a touch of dementia? Now watch this. They can't tell you what or if they had lunch today. But they can tell you what they ate in 1962. Oh, God. I'm telling you, I, told, I have been feeling weird all day today. And my wife asked me, said, you, I mean, are you sick? I, I don't even know how to describe it. I, it's weird. There's something weird happening. I'm seeing now what that is. Watch this. The church that's undertaking has spiritual dementia. They can't remember the last instruction God gave them, but they can remember what God used to do. They can't think about what's going to happen a week from now, a month from now, a decade from now. Because the enemy has so got their mind contaminated that all they can do is remember what happened. Not what is, not what will be, but what happened. It's an undertaking or beneath where they need to be type of church. And if your spiritual walk is how it used to be and you're just trying to get back to where you used to be, can I tell you how that looks like? That doesn't mean that you're bringing what was to here. That means you're going from here and you're returning back there. 
God is not calling you to go back. He said that he would repair and he would restore and he'd give back what the canker worm stole and ate. That's God's job to restore the past. Your job is to be faithful with today. And if you're not faithful with today, you won't be faithful with tomorrow. So many Christians, I just know one day God's going to do blah, 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 blah. Well, when is that one day? I don't know, but that day's coming. You wasn't faithful yesterday. You're not faithful today. And you've got no intentions of being faithful tomorrow, but you've got faith that sometime in the future, while you're still functioning in willful disobedience, that God's going to bring a blessing. It doesn't work that way. Psalm 137, verse 1, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. <laughs> When we remembered how church used to be, when we remembered how God used to speak to us, when we remember how the anointing of God felt when it fell on the place, how we sing the songs of the Lord, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? I'm going to tell you something. Singing the songs of the Lord is not just for being in the house. Singing the songs of the Lord is when we're out there, when we're in our car, when we're on the job, when we're in Walmart, when we're walking down the street, when we're playing disc golf at the park, singing songs. <laughs> we, need to, we need to go back and clean up our song list. You want to know why? Because too many songs nowadays are about emotion. It's about changing the way I feel. Instead of speaking to who we are and changing our status. I have to look at my future and declare you will be everything that God said you will be. And as an act of obedience to that happening, I have to morph today and change my position and change the way I walk and change the way I act and talk and think and everything else. I got to change the input so the output is what God says. <sighs> then there's the caretaking church. The caretaking church is all about the present. It's always concerned with pressing issues. The number one question in the mind of a now church, of a present church, is do we have enough money to get this done? Matthew 15, 32 says the people needed food, and Jesus told his disciples, provide it. <laughs> 5,000 men... No drive throughs no Amazon, no Uber Eats. They're in the middle of nowhere, no drones. And they come to Jesus and said, hey, thousands of people need food. He said, great, feed them. <laughs> so what'd they do? How much money you got? Well, I, I got 50 cents. Well, I got, I got a dollar. Will we? And so they're, they're putting their money together. And they, once they got the money together, it's like, here's all we have, but we don't even have a place to spend it. Jesus was attempting to get their eyes off the circumstance and causing them to see the finished work. The reason why so many churches never accomplish anything is because they're still saying, how are we going to afford this? How are we going to get there? Who's going to pay for this? Uh, I'm sorry, maybe. Maybe I ought to just touch lightly on this one, just jump to number three, make y'all feel better. <laughs> Jesus was, was telling them, stop discussing the problem. <laughs> Discuss the solution. We already know the problem. Listen, you got, you got marriage problems? Who don't? Well, I know Rachel and I don't, but yeah. But if you keep talking about the problem, well, you said, and you threw that food at me, 
and I know what you meant when... And what, you're fanning the flame of the problem. When you start talking about the solution, you fan the solution and you starve the... That's how we got to pray. God, help me right now. Ooh. We got to stop reminding God. Now, God, I know you called us to do da 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 And I know one day, Lord, that's going to happen. But today, we got the electric bill. We got, we, got, we got electric problems. We got AC issues. We got carpet that needs replacing. We got foundations that need fixing. And God's like, oh, I'm so glad. Oh, man, I totally slipped my mind. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. Can I say it like this? I believe in my heart of hearts that we are so focused on the problem that we miss the fact that the solution that God has to the problem is us. We keep looking for an external solution to help us. And God is saying, you it. I put my breath in your lungs. I empower you to exceed every need that would ever come in your periphery. How about this? There are people in your life that are having issues. And you keep waiting on God to send somebody to help them out. He did. He did. Third type of church is the risk-taking church. The risk-taking church is one that is constantly looking to the future. They're constantly looking forward. They invest today with purpose so they can reap tomorrow. Let me give you some examples in, in history. Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor because he had a lack of ideas. He also went bankrupt before he built Disneyland. Michael Jordan. How many watched the movie about Michael Jordan? I forget what it's called. What's it called? No. Good grief. That's the cartoon. I'm talking about the documentary of Michael Jordan's life. Space Jam, he says. That's Michael Jordan. I mean, that's Michael Jackson. Okay, whatever the movie is, it's out there, okay? Michael Jordan did not make his high school basketball team his sophomore year. <laughs> How many's heard the story of Henry Ford? Did you guys know that we had the, the Ford transmission plant downtown? When I first started out in communications, I worked in that plant. And they literally installed an elevator for Mr. Ford because he was in a wheelchair and he couldn't get to the floor. So the, the, the only elevator in the whole place was for him. And the, the floors were so saturated with transmission fluid over all these decades that when I walked even with non-slip and non-skit shoes or boots, I felt all the muscles in the front and back of my legs working so hard. It was like I was on Vaseline as I'm walking through. Imagine putting a ladder up on that. You hit the ladder and it starts sliding, right? And then you're climbing up anyway. It, it, was, it was a mess. But the history that's there, the history that's there. Listen to what happened with Henry Ford. Henry Ford failed and went broke five times before he finally succeeded. Went broke. Thomas Edison, anybody heard that name before? Thomas Edison failed 3,000 times 
before he succeeded in discovering the light bulb. So I saw this not once, but I saw two versions of this story about Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. So I want you to hear this. In 1896, Thomas Edison, the great inventor of the electric bulb, was working on an automobile design when he learned that a young man in his company had created an experimental car. Thomas Edison is known for the what? So if he's looking at building an automobile, he's looking at what kind of an automobile? Electric. Edison met this young man, Henry Ford, at a company party in New York City and was deeply impressed by his idea of the gas-powered car. So Edison, who had been considering electricity as the source of energy, cheered on Ford with enthusiasm, saying, Young man, that's what you're looking for. You've got this. I think you're right, and I encourage you to continue with your research. Edison's trying to build an electric car. A young inventor who's his competition in gasoline. And he's encouraging, you got the right idea. Not saying, scrap that, why don't you join me and help me build an electric car. He said, no, you're on to something, man. Go for it, I, I believe in you. Encouraged by the respected inventor, Henry Ford continued his work and eventually invented a card that made him rich. On December 9th, 1914, Edison's laboratory and factory were destroyed by fire. At 67 years of age, the damages were too severe for the insurance to cover. And before the ashes cooled, Henry Ford handed Edison a check for $750,000 with a note saying Edison could have more if he needed it. In 1916, Ford moved his house next door to Edison. <laughs> and when Edison was confined to a wheelchair, Ford also received a wheelchair so they could have races. Thomas Edison made Henry Ford believe in himself, creating a lifelong friendship. I need you to hear this. Your vision for your life does not have to match my vision for mine. I can support you, cheer you, fund you and be happy with your outcome. Just like you should be able to do the same for me. But imagine now the Ford company is now using what for headlights? Not lamps, light bulbs. How many of you today are blinded by the new LED headlights? Thank Edison. If it wasn't for the filament, we wouldn't know what an LED is. If it wasn't for Henry Ford, we might not know what a gasoline engine is. Do you see what I'm saying? How God used them to encourage one another, even though they were on the same track, going to go about it different ways, but encourage one another in their plight and in their, in their areas of endeavor. And then Ford Motor Company's now got to buy light bulbs from Edison's company, I think this is a picture of how ministry is supposed to happen. I want you to do what God has put on the inside of you because I think at the end of the day, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make the church more eccentric, more diverse, more full. Here's the problem. We've given up on our own vision and just decided to throw in with somebody who has one. Instead of recognizing that God wants to use the vision he placed in everybody because he knew what he was doing when he put us together in the first place. Yeah. I'm not asking you to support me in my vision. I'm asking you to let me support you and yours to diversify this thing called the church.
I want you to hear that Jericho was designed to be a problem for Israel. <laughs> it, Jericho was designed to be a problem for the church. That doesn't sound too glorious. That doesn't sound like God is really making a way. You've got to remember that Jericho was the first city that Israel came in contact with after they crossed the Jordan. It was the oldest and most protected city. It was a strategic stronghold that had to be, had to be defeated before they could enter the promised land. Why? Because if they didn't defeat them on the way to the promised land, while they're either on the way to or in the promised land, Jericho would come and get them. Here's, here's the, whoo, Jesus, help me right now. We have people that know I'm supposed to do thus and so for the Lord, but they're trying to skirt all the issues and the problems. I, I want to avoid that one. I just want to clip that course. And you think that you're making great progress, and you don't understand that what you skipped is coming for your backside. You don't go around the problems. You go through the problems. Too many people trying to skirt it. Danger. Avoid at your own risk. Yeah, yeah. Because if you avoid this problem, it will multiply before it comes for you. Stop avoiding issues. Realize that God made you a, if not the solution to that particular problem. How many ever watched Transformers? What if you're a piece that comes together to make something bigger than we could ever be? Oh, yeah. I hear some of y'all saying, I've been to so many places, and I just don't fit. And it's so discouraging. I'm just so tired of trying and going to this place and going to that place, and, and I just don't fit. It means you hadn't found the right body. Ah, I really want to move on. He's not going to let me. Sometimes we get tired of looking for God's place for us, so we decide to make a place for ourselves, and so we try to weld ourselves onto something that God never intended for us to be a part of and then get mad when it doesn't work. It works that way in church. It works that in relationships. It works that way in marriages. I'm going to say something very controversial. The Bible says what God hath joined together, let no man tear apart. Didn't say what the state put together. Dun, dun, dun. Where was God in the decision making? Where is God now in the decision making? So Jericho was designed to be a problem on purpose. See, the Jews had prepared themselves. In what way? Spiritually, they followed God's orders. They did that. And now they're ready to begin the conquest for the promised land that they know that God had designed for them. But the truth is, as it is with most things, success does not come cheap. Archaeologists will now tell us that Jericho was about 10 acres in size. Now, as a kid, I always thought that Jericho was like this ginormous, humongous city. And yet, they say now it's, it was just over 10 acres. Of course, when you say 430,000 square feet, that, whoo, that's a big, that's 10 acres. It was located about five miles west of the Jordan River and was the spiritual center of moon worship. So standing at the foot of the western hills of Canaan, the Israelites couldn't go into the, area, into the area with Jericho standing. Why? Go get attacked. So this city was designed to withstand any invasion. That's why the Bible says that Jericho was shut up. Nobody came in and nobody came out because they perceived that Israel was a threat. 
Israel had no way in outside of God. It had two walls surrounding it, anywhere from 30 to 60 feet high. That's about six stories. And from about 12 to 45 feet thick. The walls were so wide you could have chariot races on it. In fact, the Bible even talks about Rahab. Rahab built her house on the wall. This city was also important from a morale point of view because it was Israel's first challenge as a free people. And losing this battle could be disastrous for their future. I don't believe that God ever sends us into a fight that we're not destined to win. I think too often we pick fights that God never intended us to be in. So if God is leading you into a fight, then you have to have faith and a knowing in your knower that what he's brought you to, he will take you through. You have to know that for yourself. Our problem is we see something that we want, not necessarily what God said go get. And because we want it, we go after it, and when we fail and we walk away bloody, we blame God and say, well, fine, if that's the way it's going to be, then I'm not going to go for anything anymore. And we miss what the things that God tells us to go for because we spent all of our energy going for things that God never intended. So we blame God for our failures instead of owning the failures because God put in us not just the desire but the DNA to be successful, to win. We have too many people that want to win. What's that term whenever, uh, by forfeit? We want to win by forfeit. We want to take a position because somebody else left it. We want to take a job because nobody else would bid on it. I got to be careful what jobs I take. Because some jobs are meant to drain me. Some jobs are meant to waste my time and to wear me out so I'm no good for you. So I have to be very selective on what jobs I decide to take. Oh, yes, I'm going to say that too. I also got to be careful what kind, what kind of people we receive here. And I'm not talking about class of people. Because the enemy sends people to church too. To waste time, to steal resources, to stir up contention, to start bickering and fighting and backbiting and lying and, and rumor and uh, rumor mongering and all kinds of stuff. Guys, I need you to understand, I watch over you like my parents watched over me. Uh, you probably don't need to be hanging out with that person. Why? They're no good. They're trouble. Probably need to leave that girl alone. Why? There's something about her. There, there, there's an anointing on her life that does not resonate with me. And that's why sometimes I have to pull some of you guys aside and say, listen, I've seen some of your posts, and I know you're really after this particular individual or this particular ministry. I'm just going to tell you, warning, be careful, caution. I had a professor used to say, a word to the wise is sufficient. We need wins in our column. Can you imagine being either the coach of or on the team of a basketball team that has lost every game? Every game. They got to the point now they don't even console themselves. You ready to lose this one? Yeah, come on, let's go. You set the bar so low it doesn't matter. Right? This is where the church is at. 
we're so used to losing that we've embraced it as our coat of many colors instead of recognizing that we're receiving something as from God that's not from God. God has called us to win and to go at danger, not to avoid it. I might have shot a, should have brought some beef jerky and passed it out today. There's two kinds of battles. The first one is the visible battle. Joshua 5.13. So you can see all the actors in this particular passage. And the first thing that Joshua observed was a visual battle that lay before him. He sees the city. He sees it walled. He sees it six to eight stories tall. I'm going to tell you something about, about heights. Look at this beam right here. No big deal. Not that far up there. Until you're up there trying to put it up. I promise you the perspective, God help me right now. I'm telling you, man, there's something happening in me. If you don't get blessed, I'm getting blessed all by myself. There, there, there's a perspective that when we look up, that's no big deal. But if you're on a ladder touching that looking down, it's a very big deal. It's the same distance, but it's the perspective. Oh, God help me. That's why it's so easy to sit right here and go, man, you listen to this guy? What, what a quack this guy is. Because from there, the distance is not that big. But you come on this side, and the weight and the saddle that comes on the leadership, and you go, all of a sudden, you're looking this way. This is deep. It's perspective. I mowed five acres yesterday. And when I looked at the job, I said, knock that out. And no, I figured a couple hours. Man, put some high octane fuel in that zero turn, open it up. Yeah, just have fun with it. I forgot about the little pipes that were sticking out of the ground and the, and the, and the, and the, and the PVC pipes that go to the sewer and the, the signs that were cut off that had just enough signs sticking up that the blade hits it and, and the homeless stuff to leaving bottles and cans and socks and blankets and carpet and all this stuff all over the place. Y'all see my farmer's tan? From 10A to 3P, just, all I did was sit all day. And when I got off that thing, I'm like, oh, Jesus. So now when I drive by, I go, Whew. look at that job. Boy, it looks great. When ordinarily, I just said, piece of junk player. I don't, I don't care. It's just, just grass. Who cares? Now I care. Why? Because I know what it cost to cut it. Y'all ain't hearing this yet. We all love to go to a place that the grass has been cut and the edging has been done and the stickers have been removed. And we go, it's just grass. <laughs> it's just grass. <laughs> Stop me. <laughs> Because we become so accustomed to receiving stuff that we've forgotten what it is to provide stuff. God wants to make a, sol a solution that provides for other people. God wants to make us a solution to provide for other people. I think she was testing me to see if I knew what I said. So that's the visible war. And part of that, the visible giants that we might be dealing with today, it might be sickness. It might be a heart condition or an attitude. It might be dealing with people that refuse to change. It might be family issues or, or other, many other things. Whatever the giant is for you, it's real and it's standing right in front of you. When the giant's in front of you, you can't just go, can't do that. That's why I like that last song we did. Tell this giant in my face, you're not greater than my faith. I got a new thing coming. Huh? Here's the problem. We all have giants that are in front of us. And too often, almost simultaneously, 
we don't want to fight. So we're waiting on somebody, watch this, we're waiting on God to send another solution to take care of our problem so we can graduate when God has called us to be the solution so that we graduate with him and not through somebody else. Everybody's got their own giant. I can't take your first skinned knee for you. I cannot take your first broken heart for you. There's certain things I can't do on your behalf. So the second type of war is obviously the invisible war. Joshua had his own invisible battles he had to face in order to take Jericho. Remember his past failures? He and Caleb said, hey, we're well able to take the land. And they got, they got shouted down by the ten other spies. Says, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. We're grasshoppers in their sight. They'd mop the floor with us. We can't do this. I'm beginning to doubt you ever heard from God in the first place. So now Joshua is on the tail end of that, now having been in captivity and now just crossing the Jordan for freedom 40 years later. He was a fighter. Oh, yes, Lord, I'm going to say that too. He was a fighter. God anointed Joshua as a warrior. This is going to sound worse than what I mean it. Blood has a smell. Blood has a smell. Blood has a taste. And I don't have to be around somebody very long before I can smell blood on them. If they're a fighter. God help me. Too often I'm smelling spices and perfumes and food. I'm smelling baby oil and baby powder instead of blood. Everybody wants to reap the benefits of war. Not everybody's willing to fight in said war. But there's nothing in your life worth having that's not going to cost you. If you have no scars, you have no promotion. Ooh. Got too many people with self-inflicted scars, they pass them off as victories. Stupidity also carries scars. That doesn't make you a warrior. So how many wants to have a breakthrough like Joshua and take out Jericho that's standing between you and your promised land? I'm going to give you the shortest 10 steps of my career. Now, Laura, there's a right and wrong time to applaud. You did fine. You did fine. Normally, that would have been my dad, so you just got off easy. You know what I'm saying? Number one, Joshua circumcised again the children of Israel. And by that, he was sanctifying the people. You have to cut yourself loose from the flesh. The greatest impediment, the greatest hindrance to you obeying God is the flesh. You got to cut yourself off from the naps. You got to cut yourself off from the laziness. You got to cut yourself off from the discouragement. You got to cut yourself off from past failures. You got to cut yourself off from people that would drag you down instead of lift you up. You have to sanctify yourself fresh and new to the Lord. The battle can't begin until you've cut off the junk. Number two, 
He lifted up his eyes and he looked beyond the walls. This is before x-ray vision. This is before drones. He had to see in the spirit through his mind's eye what was on the other side of yards and yards and yards of wall that were six stories high. It's one thing to see somebody and size them up. I talk to the guys about this when they come to the, they come to the a men's group. So I guarantee every one of you, when you walked in, you looked around and said, I can take him, take him. Oh, stay away from that one, but I can take him. Because there's this thing on the inside of us that we, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just being real. There, there's, we're, we're designed to fight. We're, we're created for war. And that's why it's so hard sometimes for guys just to, and calm down enough to say, all right, I might want to be your friend. Because we're always so defensive. So you got Joshua having to imagine what's beyond the walls. He's not seen them. He doesn't know if it's full of Pee Wee Hermans. He doesn't know if it's Nephilim. He's not sure what's behind those walls. He just knows they sound mean. And when they saw us coming, they prepared. So we don't even have the element of surprise. They know we're here. They're on the wall looking down as they're marching around the wall. <laughs> what I'm trying to say to you is some of you are so used to where you're at, you're no longer even going around the walls of Jericho. You've camped outside them because you have no expectation that you'll ever get beyond those walls. You have to see beyond where you're at. Number three, you have to align yourself with God. How do you align yourself with God? The Bible says that Joshua fell on his face and he worshiped. Worship is the keynote of destiny. Worship is the keynote of destiny. Worship creates an atmosphere for hearing the voice of God. Worship at church, at home, in the car, in the shower. No one should ever have to, this is an irritant for me. I, I, I've been watching other churches online, okay? Not naming any names, but when, when you have to say, now come on people, you gotta pray, come on, let's all praise the Lord. If you gotta be encouraged that way to praise God and guilted into clapping, standing, saying something out loud, lifting a hand, then it's not in you to do, it's externally you're doing to shut them up. That's why you guys are so weird. <laughs> Rachel Price said, okay, let's worship. Everybody poof, just stands up automatically. Begins to sing. I, I feel, in some respects, I feel bad for newcomers. How, how, do, you, how do you warn them about you? How, how, how do you set proper expectation for the, these people are crazy. This video comes up on the screen and we got to turn the sound up because they're just, ah! how, how do you, how do you do that? You don't. So what you do is you just trick them. Hey, man, it's just church, man. Why don't you just show up and, hey, we'll go out to eat afterwards. And you sit back while they're going, ooh. <laughs> so you feel so bad, you just buy them a meal afterwards. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you can tell real quick the people who are, who are literally crawling up on top of the altar and laying down as a sacrifice because they're just, ah, they're just giving it all to God. Then you got the other people that say, this is weird. I got the joy, 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 joy. Huh? I, listen, I'm not making judgments. I'm saying what's on the inside displays itself. Now, does that mean that everybody's like, oh, that they're sincere? No. That's what discernment's for. You go, real, 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 fake. Real, real, fake, fake. But, but, but the point is sometimes those that want What's sincere and don't know how to get there may have to kickstart their motor with a little fakery before the engine kicks off and they find out it's real. Yeah. Yeah. 
Number four, the angel of the Lord said, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. I still haven't used them. I bought them all these months ago now. I need to buy myself a, a new set. How many's ever heard of grounding sheets? How many's never heard of grounding sheets? How many thinks it's a trick question? Didn't vote. So ground sheet, grounding sheets are cloth sheets that have copper fibers through them that have a cord that come off that you plug into the not not the two flat holes, but the one round hole that's the ground that goes to a physical ground. Because watch this, we are an electrical being. Why, when somebody their heart stops beating, they take paddles and. It's an electrical shock. Why? Because we are an electrical being. I'm even changing my wardrobe. I, I always wondered why God said didn't, don't mix linen and wool. And all. It's like, was that just, now you're finding out your polyesters, your rayons, all your synthetic blends, it literally, it makes you unhealthy. See this shirt? It may not be wrinkle-free, but it's electric-free. <laughs> huh? You hear what I'm saying? Wearing linen. Why? Because God designed us in such a way that we, we do well with linen, not with rayon. But watch this. But rayon sheds. It sheds. It, it, all the wrinkles fall out, and, the, and, the, and, and it looks so good. And it feels so slick when people, when people touch you, and it just, it just kind of flows in the wind, and it's cooler, and yeah. That's what the devil says. I look so good and everybody want to be around you and I, I'm just so free, light, and flowing. And, but all the time, he's hampering our ability to be who God designed us to be. Does that make sense? I just see some of y'all going. <laughs> so, so what happens is I bought, I bought these boots, right? These are called Wolverines. And I love the soles on them because they're non-skid. In fact, it sounds like when I'm out on the gym floor, it sounds like I'm wearing tennis shoes. You know, squeak, 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 squeak. But they're designed, watch this, that I can work in an electrical environment and not get shocked. Huh? But catch this, I'm an electrical being. And when I'm walking on God's earth and I'm insulated, I can't discharge. So here's what we do as beings. We wear clothes that insulate us. We wear shoes that insulate us. Our bodies start getting inflamed because all this charge has no place to go. And then, how do we discharge? <laughs> That's how we discharge. It comes out in anger and inflammation and all this stuff because it's, it's built up on the inside of us and we don't know what to do with it. So it just ah, comes out. We need to go barefoot. We need to go. When you come to church, please don't physically take your shoes off because I've smelled some of y'all's feet. You just don't need, mm. But spiritually, we need to connect to the things of God. We need to discharge all this stuff that God has got us all messed up. We also, when we come in insulated, we can't connect to one another. I, I can't receive a charge from you because I'm, you can't receive a charge from me because you're, we come into church, feel nothing, and leave and blame God when we walked in with rubber soles. We knew what we were doing when we came to church. We'll see what he's got today. We'll see what kind of anointing he's carrying. We'll, we'll just see if he can... Take your shoes off, the Bible says you're on holy ground. You've got to connect to God. Where am I at? Number five. You've got to look with the eyes of faith. How? By hearing the prophetic voice. If the Lord releases me in the next week, I'm going to deal with, with prophecy in a way you've never heard it before. Got too many people trying to judge the prophecy bearer. And, and I ain't got time. We, we, we have to be able to be in a position to receive a prophetic word. When you come in insulated, it, you have a hard time. It just bounces off. You, you become rubberized like the soles you're wearing. 
God releases something for you on your behalf, and it doesn't stick. We have to hear the prophetic word coming from God. Joshua 6, 2, and the Lord said to Joshua, see, I've given you Jericho into your hand, its king, and the mighty men of valor. What was he looking at? A huge monstrosity of a building. And God's like, see, I told you, it's right there, it's all yours. How am I going to do that? Faith always sees a victory, but doubt sees the obstacles. Faith brings a good report. Doubt brings a bad report. Faith produces a positive attitude. Doubt leads to fear, which produces rebellion. Faith sees with the eyes of God, and doubt sees with the eyes of man. We have to learn to look with faith. Number six, obedience. I hammered that one at the beginning. Number seven, position yourself according to the word of God, knowing that he's in the midst of us. Why did they send the Ark of the Covenant out in front of the people? It was a place of honor and distinction in the procession. Only the men of war were ahead of the ark. The ark came before the people. It symbolized the presence of God. It was carried in front of the congregation. It was intimate to victory. Here's my question to you. Does God have a place up front and in prominence in your life, in your job, in your home, in your marriage, in your church? Number eight. The people were forbidden to speak. We have to train ourselves to only speak the things that edify and glorify God. Whatsoever things are pure, holy, just, honest, a good report, if there be any virtue or be any praise, think on and speak those things. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Proverbs 6, 2 says, You are snared with the words of your mouth. And you're taken with the words of your mouth. Number nine, the shout. The walls came down with a shout. Why? The shout is a testimony. There comes a time when you have to lift your eyes above the problems that you have. So many of you walked in today thinking about the problems in your life instead of the solution to the problems in your life. We've got to take off our shoes and stare, stand barefooted before God. We've got to worship Him. We have to align ourselves to who He is. We have to learn how to speak those things that honor God. And then all that's left to do at the end of all that is to shout unto God. Not because things look right or feel right, but because God has said the victory belongs to us. When they stood outside the walls of Jericho, it didn't look like the walls were going to come down. I don't know that they knew the walls were going to come down. They just knew that God said, shout. Some of you don't understand why you're supposed to sing, why you're supposed to worship, why you're supposed to praise, why you're supposed to read Scripture, why you're supposed to memorize Scripture, why you're supposed to say things and pray in the Spirit. You don't understand why. You're just like, God, none of this has ever changed. I've been doing this for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and nothing's changed. And all of a sudden, out of obedience, because we did what we didn't understand, some moment in time comes when God says, now, transition from all that I told you to do and shout. And so we begin to shout in faith, and the things that seemed impenetrable and inconceivable and ununderstandable happened. Why? It was an act of obedience. Lastly, we have to anticipate victory before we can receive the promise. We have to anticipate victory. I can't imagine going into a basketball game when I was in high school and thinking, let's go, we're going to (laughs) lose. Even if we knew the team outclassed us, outshot us, was bigger than us, we 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 still kept encouraging each other in the locker room, you got this! Do what we did in practice, you got this! We expected to win up until the time we didn't. I have to see through the eyes of faith the completion. We win. Joshua 6, 15, and it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early out of the dawning of the day 
surrounded the city after the same manner. Only on that day they come past the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that the priest blew with the trumpets. And Joshua said to the people, Now, don't be silent, but shout, for the Lord has given you the city. I don't think there's a person under the sound of my voice that's not looking at some sort of a Jericho. Whether it's a financial Jericho, a spiritual healing, physical healing, domestic healing, professional healing, supernatural healing, generational healing, emotional healing, relationship healing. There's all kinds of Jerichos. And we spend too much time trying to avoid going through it. We're trying to see how God would have us to go around it. And that's not the will, plan, and purpose of God for your life. He wants you to go through it. He needs you to build some confidence both in yourself and in him in and through you. And that doesn't happen without skirmish, without fight, without blood. Last caution I give you, and then I want to pray for you. Even now, of me giving you the message, laying out the plan, giving you all the points, here's what to do, here's what not to do. If we're not careful, we fall back into the rut of what we're accustomed to doing. And what we're accustomed to doing is being insulated so that God doesn't really have the access that we say we want from him. So that when we leave here, we can blame God that he didn't perform in our lives what we expected him to do or what we say we expected him to do. We're going to have to be willing to not only be connected to him, but also connected to his people. And we're messed up, just like you are. So if you're willing to not be insulated against God and not insulate yourself against your brothers and sisters, you're willing to allow the connection of the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to inspire you, to give you instruction, and for you to be willing to obey and you find yourself facing a Jericho, I want to pray for you. If you've got a Jericho in front of you right now and you want, you want God to give you the wisdom and the plan to get through it, I want you to stand right where you're at. Lord, forgive us for insulating ourselves against you and against the people of God that you've placed in our life to fight with us, to encourage us. I'm asking right now by your Holy Spirit, God, you do what I can't and you inspire those that are standing today by faith to lay down every block that they have either built, assembled, provided, or given permission to. So that we could live defeated and make it God's fault. I'm asking today, Lord, that like the book of James says, that the, the Word of God is a mirror. I'm asking today, God, that as we look into the Word of God, that we see the reflection is not even our face, but it's the line of Judah looking back at us because you are our solution. And you've built us to demonstrate that answer in this realm and in this life. So I speak right now to all doubt, division, discouragement, everything that lies against what God's Word says belongs to us. 
defeatism, doubt, everything that we've empowered to have rights and access to our life that are not in line with thus saith the Lord. We put it under the blood today. And we walk in true liberty and freedom. Knowing that we know and are intimately acquainted with the answer. Thank you for the song, Lord, that teaches us the principle. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. So I decree right now that, Lord, you are our way maker. You're making a way, a way, not just where there seems to be no way, but in actuality where there is no way. I celebrate today, Lord, that you're bringing finances, you're bringing healing, you're bringing restoration, you're bringing deliverance, you're bringing witty ideas, you're bringing all kinds of entrepreneurships, you're bringing everything to us and in us and from within us that exceeds every need and deficiency in our life. And may we be faithful to sing and to shout your praises and to honor you for the victories. Give us a vision of what it looks like before we get there. Help us, God, to anticipate it, to see it, to expect it, and to believe you for it. Use us as a solution you designed us to be. And may that encourage us from this moment forward to be a walking, living, breathing solution to every problem we come in contact with. In the mighty, matchless name of Jesus and all God's people in agreement said, Amen. Amen. Would you turn around and face the back camera, please, while you're standing? For all of those that have caught any part of this video, we celebrate that you did. And if you're looking for a church home, there's a group of people here that would love to embrace you and to call you brother or sister in the Lord. And to, just to grow this fellowship as we await the Lord's return. We meet every Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m. Every Thursday evening, 6.45 p.m. We meet at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. And this is your invitation to come physically be a part of what God is doing here. So as we sign off, we just extend our hands towards you. We release the blessing of the Lord. We ask today, God, that you encourage them, strengthen them, and God, that you do in them what you're doing in us. I ask today, God, for those that are supposed to be here, that you provide a means for them to be here. And God, for those that are supposed to be in another place, I ask today, God, that you draw them and woo them to that particular place that they can be planted and grow and find the nourishment that they need for their life and be a blessing to those around about them. Make us all today, God, the people of God that you've designed us to be so that we can be one with you and together in glory. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.